Welcome to the session. We're going to talk about object-oriented programming. <coughs> uh, the title is uh, "Sounds Worse Than I Actually Mean It," but you know, you guys are all here, so it worked. <laughs> uh, I'm Mark Sonnebaum. I'm a performance engineer at Acquia. <coughs> you you might wonder why a performance engineer is so interested in this type of stuff, and it comes back to the the idea that you can't. It's really difficult to make something more performant that no one understands. And so the understandability and the simplicity of a system is very important when you're actually trying to make it perform. <clears throat> and I just like things that make sense. So just a quick overview of where we are. Like Drupal 7, we had some classes. <clears throat> the APIs were pretty much procedural. We all know it was not very unit testable. And we all know that it was pretty tightly coupled. And it's also very complex. I think, I think everybody could agree on that. Uh, there's, there's been better things written about the complexity of Drupal. In Drupal 8, we adopted some Symfony components. We have many more classes. We're actually still not unit testable. We're still tightly coupled. And we're actually somehow more complex. And this type of stuff sort of scares me, because <laughs> we have existing contributors who uh, shouldn't be as scared of D8 as they appear to be. <laughs> So in general, when people talk about object-oriented programming, it's talked as a tool to, uh, to manage complexity. But we somehow took that and made it more complex. And that's what we're talking about here. So I really like this quote uh, from Martin Fowler. <clears throat> the key to controlling complexity is a good domain model. And that's not really a word we, we say that often here. And every time I say model, somebody says this. <laughs> but just because you may not have the M and the C doesn't mean you don't have the M. Everyone has the M, right? If you, if you are doing anything with objects, you need a domain model. A domain model doesn't, it isn't a literal thing. Like there, there's, there are lots of uh, criticisms of object-oriented programming because it doesn't always map like to real world things. It doesn't have, like an object doesn't have to map to a real world thing. It has to map to some abstraction that makes sense in your domain. Uh, we, we have nouns that we use for these things all the time. Those are essentially what our domain uh, objects end up being. So <clears throat> they're usually nouns. Uh, I won't go too much into ubiquitous language, but uh, if you've seen, or if you read the book uh, Domain Driven Design, I highly recommend it. Um, he goes into it much more. But the basic idea is like the words we use when we're speaking to each other and the words we use when we're in code should be, or there's, there's an overlap there. And that's our ubiquitous language. Like when we talk about blocks, blocks are like, that's a very clear like, domain model. Um, yet when we're in RC, we talk about block entities and block plugins, and no one can understand each other. And that's why that, that's part of it's sort of important. So here's like the most obvious Drupal models, right? We usually think of these as entities. We just got in a patch to where all the, uh, all the main Drupal entities have interfaces now, which is great. But that's roles interface. This suggests to me that a role has no business logic. But I don't think that's exactly true. If you start looking around, you start seeing things like this. I would say that changing permissions is well within the domain of a role. That's something that maybe it should be responsible for. And that's a really simple refactoring. You just stick that on the role object. And so like, there's that one method, but then I'm implying two more with grant permissions and revoke, that however it needs to do that job, doesn't really matter. Those methods should just exist on that object. Comments look similar. Now here's just a sort of a shortened list of its properties. Notice the comments on a bunch of those properties. The names are really ambiguous, right? What, what, is a, what is mail on a comment, right? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. But the comments tell you what it is. In most cases, if you look through Drupal code and see a comment, think about if that could be a better method name or something that describes that thing better. Don't be afraid of using multiple words. Like long variable names and long method names are totally fine if they say exactly what they do. That's always better than a comment. 
So the first thing I would do to refactor this is I would add descriptive accessor methods. And so it would end up looking something like that. But now there's sort of another code smell. Whenever you're working with one object, if another noun starts appearing in a bunch of methods, that's a good indication that you probably need another object. Now people who understand the entity API are probably freaking out now because they're like, you can't do this. Um, and that may be true, although I don't know if I actually believe that because still these are like the internal properties to comment and comment can instantiate its values however it wants to. So I don't, I don't see a reason why we couldn't say make a comment author object because this isn't exactly a user, right? This isn't our normal user object. This is a comment author. It may inherit from user and may not. It doesn't seem like it has the same responsibilities, right? But just having something that says a comment author is a thing that we have and a thing we refer to in this domain tells you a lot about what's going on. So here's another instance of uh, hidden business logic and procedural functions. This function prepares the author object that we're, or the author uh, property we were talking about before. There's not really a reason that that needs to exist outside. But it also suggests something else. So if you look at that actually, so it's saying entity create with a UID of zero. We all know that UID zero means anonymous. But that, that's really just an implementation detail. There's no reason we need to just code that all over the place with that assumption and have all of our code know that zero means anonymous. I don't see why we wouldn't just have an anonymous com comment author. It can inherit from comment and just hard code its UID to zero. And then that code, I think, reads much better. <clears throat> so this is from the actions module. Uh, this one is pretty rough. Um, and and th this should stay there, right? So it's the actions module. It's an action that's not going to go anywhere. But <clears throat> it knows how to find the subject within the comment, which would be one thing if it was just subject, but it's actually subject value, which is a little strange. Um, it also knows how to get to status, and it knows the uh, constant to compare it to. Now you could say there's an argument that like that's sort of okay because these, were the, these are within the same package of comment module, and I would believe you, but there's really no reason it needs to do that. So when you have, like when you look at the code around an object, you should always remember like it doesn't have to know how you, like this object is gonna do something. It just needs to say what it wants, right? It just needs to tell it to do something. So this is what this code I think should look like. You just call a publish method or you just call a subject method. Doesn't matter where that comes from. The contract here is just, I'm going to call subject on you and you're gonna return me a string. And then it's up to comment module to, or comment uh, class to do that. And so here's another instance of like knowing those constants. <clears throat> and in this case, it's actually looking if it's published or not. And when I see that code, I say, okay, there's a business case for having an is published method. And then we just add that. And you probably recognize that publishing is actually not unique to comments at all. And when we see things like that, uh, those are basically roles that those objects are playing. And I would say that's like a publishable roles. And when you see those, we need to extract those out into interfaces. So we could have a publishable interface with those three methods. And then comment and node can just uh, implement those. And then the methods that actually uh, handle publishing, they could potentially just type in publishable if that's all they do. And then that tells you a lot about that code. That code says, I need an uh, object that I can call these three methods on. Uh, it's a very, uh, very clear contract. I get told this once in a while. And so uh, for, those, for those who haven't heard, the single, single responsibility principle um, <clears throat> is about not ever making a class with more than one responsibility. The problem with that is it's a really difficult thing to, uh, to reason about. I really like this quote from Eric Evans again, uh, Domain Driven Design. Basically suggests there's, a, <laughs> there's complexity in doing that, and the more you do that, 
the more you get away from the actual fundamental concept of object-oriented uh, programming, which is you have, you couple the data to the behavior that acts on that data. I'm not saying that, that single responsibility principle is wrong, it's absolutely not wrong, but don't go nuts with it. You can really take it too far. And figuring, like reasoning about what a responsibility is, is actually much more difficult than you'd think. Um, the more you think about it, trying to narrow down what a class is doing, uh, the more I think it's, uh, it's sort of a subjective thing sometimes. I think it's easier to think about it in terms of a reason a class would change. Right, if you have two methods that sort of look like they're maybe doing something that doesn't uh, belong in the same class, but they would always change together, I don't think that's that big of a deal. But if a change somewhere else would cause one of those methods to change, maybe that's a sign that it should get moved out into its own class. So there's a balance, I think, between <clears throat> single responsibility principle, principle and a rich domain model, and we just need to find that. And uh, <clears throat> one, one indicator we don't use enough is pain, right? <laughs> the way I like to code is I like to start with the simplest possible thing. I don't worry about like what rules I'm breaking. I just do it how it makes sense to me. And then the first time I encounter pain, I refactor. And we, we sort of default to pain. We cause ourselves pain because we over abstract and we may never actually use that abstraction. And then we end up with more complicated code um, that's painful to use all the time. So sometimes, and I understand like we can't always wait because we're getting something into a product that's gonna ship, but we have pretty long release cycles. So it's not really that bad to, uh, to get something in that's less abstract, let three years go by, see if something else needs it, and then if something else needs it, you extract it then. So there's a bunch more cases of uh, hidden business logic in procedural functions. It's a really, really th easy thing to fix. You just have to go find it and then stick it on the appropriate class. If it makes sense that you need a new class, just make a new class. Not every class in Drupal needs to be uh, what's called like a framework object, right? It doesn't need to be a config entity or an entity. We can just have classes that don't inherit from anything. That just play like a single role. And that's totally fine. So just really quickly, I want to talk about like types of domain objects. I think like, this comes from the Domain Driven Design book. I think it's pretty helpful, to, uh, helpful way to think about things. So entities, in the sense of like outside of Drupal, are defined as like having identity. So generally, anything with a UUID is an entity. Uh, they're treated as mutable, and they have state. They're usually nouns. Drupal entities and config entities are a good example of, of actual entities. And this is the important thing. This is how you spot it. All of the attributes can change on an entity, but it's still, like, its identity remains. It's still that entity. On the other side, you have value objects. They have no identity. Their uh, immutability, I know that's not something we really deal with that much, but you can still treat an object as immutable. It has state, usually nouns. Uh, the fields, I think, are a good example of value objects. And the important thing about them is the only way you can identify is, it is, is by its attributes. If you change its attributes, it's a different object. And ideally, you shouldn't change its attributes. You should just instantiate a new object with those attributes. So you have those two things. Then you have services. Services should be stateless. And they're usually verbish. I ask that uh, you try to make entities and value objects before you make services. Uh, I thought we were actually a lot worse about this than we were. Uh, the more I look through the services we have, most of them are actual services. And I think that's because most of our business logic is actually still in procedural code. But as we move that stuff over, it would be very easy. I mean, we, let, we talk about services all the time. We love services. It would be very easy to start taking functions and say like, okay, or the, like the comment, comment prepare author and somebody makes the comment prepare author service. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That's actually just putting behavior into a service that should be on the object that it actually acts on. And I like these quotes about it. Um, you should just use them sparingly. Don't let them take over behavior from the objects that should have them. And the, the, the second one really hits home because you realize the more you do that, <clears throat> 
you're slipping towards procedural programming. Right? When you end up with dumb data objects that have no behavior, and then a bunch of services, it's not that different from just data structures and functions. And if you don't uh, read this, the Martin Fowler article, The Anemic Domain Model, I highly recommend it. I think that describes essentially where we are right now. And basically, like, when you don't do this, you're robbing yourself of the benefits of object-oriented programming, which I think is one of the reasons that things are so complex right now, and no one can understand uh, this new code, and there's people rejecting the idea of object-oriented programming, it's because we're not, when you, when you leave out the domain model, <coughs> you don't get the benefits of it, and so then you're just, you just have a com more complex version of what we had before. The naming. Anybody who knows me knows I like to talk about naming. It's really, really important. Everyone likes to talk about cache invalidation and naming, how it's so hard. Naming is not hard. Naming classes and methods with poorly defined roles and responsibilities <laughs> is hard. So if you find yourself having a hard time naming a class, think about what that class is doing. It might be doing too much, or what it's doing may not make sense. If you distill down, and basically you describe, okay, look, look at the comment on the top of a class. There's quite a few cases where the comment actually says what it does, but the class itself doesn't suggest that in any way. So here's one example I found in Core. I apologize to Cat Bailey for this. Um, but I think a lot of this is actually just like legacy, chem, like coming from the original procedural design that this was just like the first iteration. And this is actually totally fine. Like we take the procedural code, we move it into classes, we do it however it works, but we don't stop there. We have to then refactor and figure out how it makes more sense. So just take a, like a quick look at these, uh, these method names. There's some strange stuff going on. The first thing that I notice is that those three terms are used to describe the exact same thing, right? Paths that are not aliases, we don't have a good name for. What's the difference between get path alias and look up path alias? I don't know. If you look at this, you see the only thing this uh, function is doing is it's getting the default language and then it just delegates to look up path source. Uh, I would refactor that to take out that language behavior into its own method. All of a sudden, that's only one line. And then just copy the rest of that function into this original one. And then you don't have these two methods that uh, don't make, or they basically say they do the same thing, right? But that didn't tell the story because there's something else happening. So it is better, but the vocabulary is still a little inconsistent. This is the way I would uh, name them. I like, uh, I like using find, because I think that's actually what's happening here. And I think path is actually totally fine. If you just say path, that means path. If we say alias, that's a path alias. We could argue about path, that's totally fine, as long as we settle on one, right? And so I think it makes sense to say find path by alias, or find alias by path because that's all those methods are doing. We still have some of these other methods here. Uh, get path lookups and preload path lookups, they're actually only called by this decorator. And so I would say if they're only called by that one decorator, they should actually just go into those and just refactor them out into that class. But we still have this cache clear method, which is a little odd, because if there's a cache decorator, why does the, why does, uh, any cache anything happen in this class. I would say that probably shouldn't happen, and we should refactor that into that uh, cache decorator. And then those are gone. And then there's path alias whitelist rebuild. That's also only called by cache clear, and if we remove that, we can remove this. Now there's also this class. <laughs> This is essentially what it looks like with the code taken out. So the path class manages CRUD for path aliases. There's a responsibility overlap uh, with, over, or with alias manager because it's the thing managing aliases. 
even though the manager actually means nothing and it's more of a repository. Um, I would say just stick this stuff in Alias Manager. If, you're, if, there, if one class says, I can find this by a given criteria, why shouldn't that class, that class also already has a database connection, it already knows about these objects, knows how to find them, why shouldn't it also just uh, save them and load them, right? I also changed these method names, because um, before they were load and delete, and then they took conditions, right? So I think that's probably better reflected in the uh, method signature, and so I named it find where and delete where. I don't remember where I got that. It may have been from backbone model, but like if you look at like backbone model or like uh, active record or um, what's the PHP one? Doctrine. They have all kinds of these like find find by attributes, uh, find where type classes, and it's always good inspiration for these things because that's what the rest of the world uses. So another problem we have is emphasizing systems over the domain. What I mean by that is uh, this. So if, if you were to find our user model, it's buried in here under plugin core entity user. So if I want to understand the user model, I also have to understand entities and plugin. This is actually what it could be now um, because Tim Plunkett is awesome and we got in this uh, custom entity type annotation so that now the annotation on them is no longer plugin, which enables this. So we can just have entity type. That makes a whole lot more sense. If it was possible, I'd actually just prefer to get rid of that and just have user. And somebody's saying, oh, but how do you find the things? Um, I'd prefer that we always do the best design. And without, like, without regard to performance or anything else, do what makes the most sense Let's decide that's the way we should do it. There are tons of smart people in this community that will solve the technical problems with it. So we shouldn't design with how it's gonna work or how it's gonna perform in mind all the time. There are cases where that's an exception. But in this one, I don't think there is because we came up with this idea of finding plugins based on namespaces and then getting that from the container, which if you've ever looked at the container and how it does that is really crazy. Um, but there's other ways to, to perform that job that don't like poison our namespaces like this. And so we're already on, like, on the right track to, to fixing this, but there's one example um, of us just like we, we, we like, we like to talk about everything in terms of plugins and entities, and we talk about the system it uses before we talk about it. It's really sort of an ancillary thing. It doesn't matter that Block uses entities or plugins, it just matters that Block is Block. So here's a, a slightly uh, less bad example, but I'm still not crazy about it. Um, so custom block controller calls entity manager. Custom block controller knows about custom blocks. Why should it know anything about entity? I think it could just be that. And this is sort of more of like the active record approach, which I'm sure somebody will, will argue out of, which is fine. If you need to be fancy, you can have it injected and just have a custom block repository. And that could inherit from the entity manager, which I think is more of an entity repository. Um, it could share all of that functionality, but I think it is important to just subclass that and have that object live in its own domain. The more your classes talk to itself, well first, the best thing is talking to yourself, right? Calling methods on self. The next best thing is calling methods on objects that you own. Right, custom block controller is in the same package as custom blocks. Tot it's always safe to call methods on those. You won't end up with refactoring issues because they're in the same package. It's just a way of protecting yourself against what goes on outside. The controllers. Sort of a new thing for us, although really they're just page callbacks um, in terms of how we're using them. Here's one example in the aggregator where it's actually calling the database and it's getting a list of aggregator items. That's not really, uh, or that, that's actually business logic in itself. That doesn't belong in a controller. When we find stuff like that, that means it needs to be moved to some domain object. Just as a random example, I know, I know Larry is cringing at my new, um, 
But let's just call it, there's an aggregator feeds uh, class, right? That's essentially what it's doing. That's what it's getting back. Yeah, I said aggregator items before, it's, it's feeds. I always like to create simple accessors uh, for, for domain objects within uh, sort of like glue code objects like controllers. And so it actually do this. So like what I said before, it's always, always uh, best to call methods on self, right? And so you're not actually dealing with that class or even a, an injected thing. Admin overview only calls this feeds method. It knows it gets an object back that it could call find all on. And then this feeds method actually handles the instantiation of that. And so it only does this new hard-coded class if it isn't set previously. Larry's also gonna hate this, but this is actually a reasonable way to manage dependencies in some cases. If you do this, I can still unit test that class. Because one, I can inject that feeds variable, so the, the hard-coded one will never get instantiated. But even if I wasn't doing that, I could actually subclass it, replace that method with a stub, and test that stub. You don't want to do that all the time. Like, I think dependency injection is a really good thing, and we should be doing that most of the time. But this is an option. You can totally do this, and it's okay. So I would say, dumb down a controller until it's not even worth testing. Because we really shouldn't be testing controllers. And if we have, uh, we have uh, logic in there that needs to be tested, let's, we should just move it out. So I touched a bit on uh, unit testability and coupling previously, but I want to take you through my experience trying to test uh, this map class. Map is a class in type data. Um, it's essentially a hash for people who think of them as hashes. It should be a pretty simple thing to test. Uh, so I just took the existing test from uh, our unit test base class, the type data thing, and just made a simple PHP unit test. All this does is it iterates over it, and then it counts how many times it iterated. And then it should equal the number of items that I passed into it. I passed two items into it. And if you notice, I instantiated this map class with that value. So it looks like it has everything it needs. So this is the first message I get, it failed. It didn't work like, it didn't work at all. I then discovered I had to pass set value and give it the value again. It's a little strange, but okay. <laughs> that, that got me going. And then the next uh, error I got was an undefined function called a cache. So that's in cache decorator uh, for plugins. Just to get to the next thing, I went in there and, and just hacked it out. <laughs> now I get this. Hack that out. Now that. This is a special example because I feel like we, like we, like we just default to using format string all over the place um, or check plane, which is fine when you need to use check plane, but for format string, this is actually used in an exception. I don't, like, I don't really know why we ever use that in exceptions. Like, why don't we, we could just use sprintf. If I'm wrong, we can talk about that, but let's figure out something because we shouldn't be calling procedural functions and exception messages. And now I get this. And this got called somewhere within the, like, the type data, like magic functions. Um, and so I hacked that out as well. And that's how I hacked it out. Finally, after all that, this test passes. So the thing to understand here is that inheritance is hard coding a dependency. We're very sensitive in code to seeing a class's name, right? And in general, that's not a great practice. But we inherit all over the place. And the thing I want everyone to know is that it's the same thing. It's actually, this is a, uh, a tighter form of coupling to that class. There's no way I can mock this. There's nothing I can do. It is essentially like taking on that class. If you're a base class <clears throat> and we're saying uh, these are our base classes, everyone should inherit them, you have a responsibility to not screw your subclasses, right? Just this simple tiny map class had problems from like two different problems from these two different systems. These systems should not make other code untestable. Yeah, and so, touching on what I was mentioning before, uh, 
Um, here's another example of just like calling, uh, calling a dependency directly in a method like this. <coughs> so sure, this should be injected. I think there's maybe issues right now with injecting things like this into entities. And if that is the case and you can't do that, the bare minimum, just hide every dependency in a method. As like I was saying before, that's still testable. I can replace that. And you just don't want that save function. That save function, uh, its responsibility is to save things. It shouldn't have any knowledge outside of that, right? And this is a super, super simple thing to do. I don't think there's any reason to not ever do this. Whenever you have a dependency, just hide it in a method. I mean, I even do this when they're, when they're injected. It's just, a, it'll save you having to refactor the thing that has the logic in it. So I actually think single responsibility principle is more important when applied to methods. And it's a really easy thing to apply. So if you have a method that has more than one responsibility, like it's fetching something from the database, it's applying some business logic and it's say like calling watchdog, you can pretty easily refactor that into separate methods. Those separate methods will, like, will be pretty easy to name because they just do that thing that you need done. And then that class is gonna be simpler to understand and easier to refactor. So our code is still, as we saw before, very tightly coupled. If you can't use PHP unit to test your class, you cannot claim that your code is loosely coupled. There's a lot of talk in Drupal 8 about how like, more loosely coupled things are, but there are not a lot of PHP unit tests. And for, for those of you who don't know, we got PHP unit in uh, a few months back. You can now test any class in Drupal with PHP unit and prove that it is decoupled. Drupal unit test base is not a unit test. And actually unit test base is not a unit test. Here's an example of a unit test base. A unit test should not have a database connection. So please, I know like uh, I don't actually think that um, none of our code got, uh, got more loosely coupled. I know it is but please just go prove me wrong by writing tests. I really want to be wrong about that. And the more we write tests, the more we will find these issues like I found with map, because it's very easy to ignore when all the code is loaded all the time. So if you write a PHP unit test, no code is loaded except for uh, what's auto-loaded. And so get through the test, get it passing with that, and then you know that class has no hidden dependencies. So I think there's actually still time to do this. Uh, I don't think any of these, or any of the stuff I'm showing is, uh, necessarily that time consuming in terms of refactorings because really like they are just refactorings. There's not changing functionality, it's just taking our existing code and making it simpler um, and moving things around. So that's really all I want to do. I just want to make Drupal simpler and I think everyone wants that. And so there's a Sprint Friday. Um, if you're interested in working on this type of stuff, uh, I will be there, happy to help people out with it. And just a couple of uh, books I recommend. Uh, I <coughs> feel like there's, there's, some, there's some good design books out there that have really helped me understand this stuff, especially if you're new to object-oriented programming. Uh, for, for if, you're, if you're into this stuff and you feel like you have like, a really good uh, foundation, I love small talk best practice patterns, but it's not the easiest book to read because all the examples are in small talk. Um, this is actually a really great book, and a lot of the uh, patterns apply to Drupal. And I'll put these slides on, uh, online, so don't worry about copying them down. Uh, refactoring is also another great one. Domain-driven design I quoted heavily in this. Uh, this is actually the bulk of what I'm talking about here. And this is actually one of my favorite new books. Um, it says it's about Ruby, but it's really just about object-oriented design, and it's explained in like the simplest, like easiest to relate to terms, and it talks about everything in terms of like the benefit, like you do this and this is the benefit that it gets you. Um, and I think anybody in the Drupal community who feels sort of new to object-oriented programming and doesn't feel like they understand it, I highly recommend that book. It's really great. <coughs> Thanks. So are there any questions? And if you have a question, you're supposed to come up to that mic. Or anybody who wants to talk with me or tell me that I'm wrong. It's not much of a core conversation. All right. I'll, I'll raise the challenge.
even though I'd usually love to tell you you're wrong, I, I thought you were mostly right on here. And um, so a, a question, I guess, in terms of core development, uh, how much do we need to block police on the developer experience being good? That's a great question that I can't answer. Um, yeah, the question is like, how much would we like block release on the DX being bad? Um, I, I don't like to think in terms of blocking since that's clearly not, not my call. Um, but I don't think there's, I mean, when we think like, okay, we don't want to block on this, so that means maybe we don't have time to do it. I think that maybe just encourages people not working on it. I would say, um, let's assume we're gonna ship D8 in, in, in a state that makes sense. So we should just continue to work on this stuff until, until we release. That's sort of a dodge, but I think I said something. Um, so I think, um, like you were talking about Ruby and Active Record earlier, and I think the way that they do domain modeling is like very intuitive, you know? They, they have all of their like static binder classes and saving classes on the model object, the entity object itself, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, in the PHP world, the, the like preferred way to do that is to inject dependencies Oh, hey. Oh, Thanks. yeah, it helps if you turn the mics on, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, should I repeat what I was uh, saying? Keep maybe? going. I'll, I'll summarize it. Okay. Um, so, the preferred way, I think, in PHP instead is to inject dependencies into, like, a manager class, right? And that does the finding and saving, so, you know, et cetera. But I think that results in a more complex domain model, right? And, like, an uglier looking code to, like, end users who are using your interfaces. Um, what do you think about that? Okay, that, like, yep, happy to talk about that. Um, so the question is about, like, if you ever looked at Rails uh, and the, the active record pattern, um, like, if you had a user class, you would call, like, user static method find, and then you'd get users back. You don't have a separate object. Like, that's the same user class that you would then instantiate. And the active record pattern, um, it, it's where you have, I mean, this is going to be a gross over, oversimplification, but it's where you have the persistence layer and the, the domain object, like, all in the same object. And, and so you mentioned, like, the PHP world, we tend to do it uh, in another way where you have, like, repositories and stuff. Um, those two patterns, actually, they're in the, um, they're in this book. Uh, that actually has the active record pattern. This book is actually sort of the secret manual to Rails. Um, and then there's also the data mapper pattern, which I think is what you're talking about. Um, uh, doctrine, from what I've seen, looks like it does the data mapper pattern. I don't think it's actually bad, um, because the basic idea is you split it up into your domain models, and then you have repositories. Repository has a place in your domain. Is it, and I think when you call it that, it says, it what, it says uh, actually what it is. If we call it a manager, it's more ambiguous. But a repository is a domain object, that I talk to to get instances of this type of object. It's certainly more complex. I think if we actually did something that looked like active record, we'd be totally fine, but I don't really want to make that argument. So I'm fine with doing like a more data mapper style thing. So I wanted to ask again actually about the question about whether we should uh, block release on DX problems. I actually have, it's part of my job to try to help answer that question. So code freeze is July 1st and the idea is that Five weeks from now, we can't change our public APIs anymore. And so the question becomes, how much refactoring can we do that's not going to change our current public API? Do we consider namespaces part of our public API for July 1st? Because if we do, then, you know, that sort of reduces what, and like, question, so can you, can you, like, talk about what you think we can and can't do, or sure. do you have any idea? Um, okay, so what I'm talking about would definitely involve public API changes. But they don't necessarily have to involve public API, BC, BC breaks, right. right? So say like in the example uh, we're showing like, like the comment prepare author, we could move that in, we could create that new pet method on comment, but we could leave that function and then just move uh, the guts of that function is just passing through to that class. Um, we've done that in a few areas. Like there's a lot of, there, I mean there's, if any of you have uh, been in the core queue following this stuff, like there's lots of patches that are just moving these functions into classes. Um, some get rid of them, some mark them as deprecated, some just leave them. I like leaving them and marking them as deprecated. Uh, 
we have procedural code. We're going to have it for a long time. We have dot module. That's what that is. There's people are going to want or need to call those procedural functions, and it's totally fine. You just can't do it in a class. I probably should have said that earlier. You can't call a procedural uh, function in a class. That's like violating a boundary that introduces hidden dependencies and makes that class totally untestable. So we can do that and leave those functions. We just can't actually use them inside of classes. Um, so I think we can actually do this in most cases without breaking BC. And it, in terms of like public, it's really important uh, distinction. Um, we don't need a default to making everything public. If there's no reason to, or for, if, if a method is intended to only be called within that object, just make it protected. And then we don't have something that could potentially break BC. Because everything that we make public, I like, uh, like Martin Fowler has the concept of a, of a published interface. It's like a step beyond public. It's like we have our public interface and then we release. Now we're really on the hook for never changing those. And so if we think it might change, if we feel like it's unstable, let's just make it protected. We can always change that if it, if it ends up being an issue, but um, that, that puts us in a safer spot. So for the record, I don't actually disagree with 95% of what you said. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, the only thing I'd add is um, Drupal does have something of an upper bound here simply because so much of what Drupal does is by design runtime dynamic that does limit the ability, your ability to you know, use method names to document what's going on when what's going on is going to vary depending on what a user configured in some form over there. So there, there's a limit to how far we can go with this, but in a general sense, I mostly agree with you. Um, so if anyone thinks that there's you know, <laughs> a blood feud here, no, there isn't. <laughs> well, and, and to comment on that, though, I think there are definitely cases where you can say, like, yeah, it would be nice to have this method that says what this thing is, but in this context, I don't have the knowledge about that because it's some user configured thing. I would say in that case, I mean, it's clearly not appropriate, but it gives us a better understanding of what our domain, our domain is to understand that because our domain is not solving like these business problems that sites have. Our domain is making software that builds websites. Right, and so that, that generic part of it, of just getting information that a user configured and then doing something with it, like that's our domain problem. And so methods that reflect that are, are very informative. So they made up, you know, find by query object that the user configured somewhere, you know, find by view or something yep. like that. Yeah, and that, that explicitly states this is the lowest uh, level of abstraction that we, can, that we can deal with. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much for showing up.